Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited about the event that we have for you right now. We have our friends from SCARE from the Ventura County office. They are going to present us with songs, dances, and stories from our local Native American family. And uh, we, we, we hope that everybody enjoys all the dancing and the music and the storytelling that we have for you today. Uh, of course, before we get started, we would like to let you know that um, we do have an opportunity for people to ask questions and to interact with our presenters today. However, we do need to make it clear that as a college campus, we are going to ask you to please be respectful in all of your comments and questions. Uh, in other words, we will not tolerate any form of cyberbullying or negative uh, comments or anything like that. But for now, again, we are so happy and thankful that we have our friends from SCARE here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to them and they will uh, work with those presentations. Take it away, SCARE. Good morning, my name is Marcy Escobar. I'm the MIS specialist with SCARE, which is Southern California American Indian Resource Center. Uh, we offer employment, education, and emergency services for Native American, Native Hawaiian, and Alaskan families. Um, first and foremost, I just want to also introduce my, uh, this is our resource advocate, um, administrative assistant, Mackie Robinette. And we also have with us uh, Kate Torich, who's our career counselor. Um, first and foremost, we respectfully want to begin with the land acknowledgement here in Ventura County. Um, so I have a little something here to read. San Juan of Ventura, the city of good fortune, now known as Ventura, was founded 1782. But our history goes back centuries earlier to its first inhabitants, the Chumash Indians. The Chumash are a Native American tribe who historically inhabit mainly the southern coastal region of California in the vicinity of what is now Santa Barbara, Ventura extending, and Ventura extending as far south as Malibu. They also occupied three of the Channel Islands, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, the smaller island of Anacapa was uninhabited. Modern place names with two mash origins include Malibu, Longfolk, Ojai, Point Magoo, Peru, Lake Castaic, and Simi Valley. The name Chumash is loosely taken from the Santa Barbara dialect of the Chumash language and refers to the Chumash people from Nimu, Santa Cruz Island. The Chumash is said to mean bead maker or seashell people, being that they originated near the Santa Barbara coast. Before the mission period, the Chumash lived in over 150 different independent villages, speaking variations of the same language. Much of their culture insisted of basketry, bead manufacturing and trading, cuisine of local abalone and clam, herbalism, which consisted of using local herbs to produce teas and medical reliefs, rock art and the scorpion tree. Peaceful and very skilled at a variation of essential survival techniques, the Chumash lived in villages of thatched huts near the Ventura beach and called this area Shishalo. They were hunter gatherers dependent on natural resources for their food and shelter traveling between the mainland and the Chano Islands in 25 foot long tumults, which are plank canoes. People are becoming more aware of the importance of historic preservation, but it takes many people working together to preserve a town's rich history. Ventura has a story to tell. You just have to listen. Today, there is a resurgence of interest in Chumash culture and heritage, and many descendants still call Ventura their home. Now, along with my ancestors, and our most gracious community, our SCARE family may do so as well. I hope you enjoy today's event. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Mackie Robinette. I'm the resource advocate and admin here at SCARE. Our first performance is gonna be from Julie Tumamayet. So Julie is the chairperson of the Barbarino Venturino Band of Mission Indians. She is a respected singer, storyteller, and cultural resource consultant and advisor. Her family and ancestry has been traced to at least 11 known Chumash villages, as far back historically as the mid 18th century, prior even to the Portola expedition of 1769 into Alta California. Julie is an artist, 
that uses native materials to create her jewelry, musical instruments, and basketry, and is well known throughout Ventura County and beyond for her Chumash cultural educational programs and performances ceremonies according to her native ways, such as weddings, burials, naming ceremonies, and blessings, all while continuing to practice and teach her native language. We're going to be watching some storytelling from Julie. Aku, Santana Sapeoe, no I'm Jumash Kathaluna Limu, Boyo. Hello, greetings. My name is Sapeoe, She Who Flowers. I am Jumash and I live on Limu, which is in the sea. Today you know it as Santa Cruz Island. So I am here to come from the past to tell you about how we are still here to tell you about our universe and how we see our world around us, that all things are, are connected and created as one. I have here our sacred water, oh, and the wiwe. As I say, prayers for all living beings and for all humans and animals that swim, that walk on four legs, that fly through the air and crawl under the ground. All those rooted people that are in the world. Where would we be? Where would we be? On Limu, there's so few things over there. It's a beautiful place to be. But I pine sometimes for, for my relatives coming back from, from over in the big land across the grandmother ocean for all the, the other types of food and plants that are over there. But I love my island. I love my place. We have been here for such a long time that we share our words, our blessings to everybody in the world here that we talk about a place in which where we honor not only those of us who live here in the our middle world but those that live up in mishupashup the sky people and those that are the, that we fear down below in Goyanashu, and in between those places those sacred places where the eagle holds his wings out and he spreads his wings out and right now we are in this space of grandmother Achai, Grandmother Moon, Lime Achai, and her brightness and her brilliance. As I go into my stories, we will talk about those people. My, my grandson, Juan de Jesus Tumamayat, and how his name carries on into the future. How we honor that sacred space below us with the snakes and the serpents laying and moving about, causing earthquakes and tremors in this world. And how we didn't in this time in my life, we did not believe in this heaven and hell, but we had a land of the dead where people went past Cassiopeia into that place of Shimilakshka. And where after 12 years of being in that place, they come back as what and as who, we don't know. We don't know if we have that choice. So I pray I come back maybe as, as a dolphin I would love that. So as we say our greetings and honoring to the sky people, the sun that is coming and back into his uh, southern path. Oh, there was a time just a couple moons ago where, oh, he was so dark and he was fading away. And it, we thought maybe if we don't do these prayers at the end of our, our solar year, oh, he may just fall off the edge of Mishupashup and we'd never see him again. But we do our prayers and we come together and we pray to call him back up. And here, here he is bringing light and warmth to the world again in our long days. So we are so grateful for that. We have been here, as I said, so for such a long time. And there are stories about how we are created into this world. And one of these stories comes from one of your relatives, Maria Solaris. And those people, those wisdom keepers, those storytellers, all those who remember and are, have no fear of telling these stories, and you, you are so grateful yeah, and should be grateful for them because we need to remember. So in this story, Sahipaka, once upon a time, the lands were really big and really spread out here. There were some people, of this, this is before us, our two leggeds came here. That, that the land was so vast and there were these great people of great sizes, Momolakwiku, humans, two-leggeds and four-leggeds of gigantic size. You know, they could cross over Grandmother Ocean and go to 
to Limu and, and the islands there without the use of the boats, that's how big they were. But then one time it started to rain and the rains came and came and came until pretty soon all the water started meeting up. The creeks and the rivers started flowing together. They started meeting up with the ocean and as they're moving about, all the lands were covered in water and the water started to rise. And not didn't take very long as the first people were fearing what was, they couldn't understand what was happening. And as the waters enveloped them and drowned them and they all died, all except one little animal, Makutikak, spotted woodpecker. He was on the last tree here in, in Thiashu, on the very tippy top. And he's calling, he's calling up to the people, the sky people up in Miss Shupashu. Oyot, Oyot! He would yell, he was so cold and shivering. Well, the sky people are moon, sun, morning star, evening star, dawn, who is the breath of the sun. Sun had two daughters. There was Sky Coyote, Snilly Moon, and a cute little lizard up there living around. Well, as the daughters looked at the edge of Mashupashup and saw that poor little pitiful bird, Coco, Father, Tom, look. And as the sun looked down, go, ah, haku, haku, la hoop wash wash it. What do you mean, hello, hello, how am I? I'm cold and I'm hungry. Aren't you going to save me? He says. Well, sun goes, all right, all right, yes, okay. And he throws them East Spanish, the acorns. Oh, this little bird was so grateful as they floated on the water towards him that he started gathering up the little acorns and cracking them with his strong beak. And then he started getting an idea and he goes, oh, he's still acting hungry. So his son was throwing him more of the ishpanish. He started pecking holes in the, in the tree, the branch, the trunk of the tree, and he started storing them in there. Well, finally, his son had enough of that. He caught onto him real quick and he grabbed his fire stick and he put it in the waters and as his, because his fire stick was, was a, a bark only from the trees that grow up there in this shupa shup. And as he lights it up, he blows off and flicks off the, the flames from his fire stick. And that's how some of our stars were created, when those embers going up into the sky. Well, as he put his fire stick in the waters, the water started to recede and going back into their rivers and back into their creeks and ponds and, and, and smaller areas. And the land came back the ocean was separated again. Well, the first people, the Momola Kuiku, they, because they had perished, they had also turned to stone. So we see, you know, you will see that they're still here with us in the mountains and in the rocks on the, upon the earth. And you will recognize your relatives when you see them as you go about and around. Well, it was time to put people back into the world. So up there in the Shupa Shup, there was a great table, rectangular in size, shining and glistening. And anything you put on that table left an exact impression there, could never be changed again. Well, as the people gathered, moon came out, sun's daughters, sun, morning star, everybody gathered, Snilly Moon gathered, and even little lizard kind of kept his distance a little bit over there to the side. Well, everybody had all man's body laid out, his head, his body, his arms, but there was something missing. And people looked at the end of these stumps and they go, what? Look, you forgot to give man hands. Well, everybody always go, that's silly. How's he going to do things? How's it going to work? Somebody said, how about giving them fins? No, we gave those to the fish. Well, how about claws? No, that might not work either. Well, how about wings? No, we already, well, let's figure something out. Well, Snilly Moon thought, hey, what about my paw? I've got very beautiful hands and holds up his paw. And everybody looked and they thought, hmm, that might work. And so it was decided that Snilly Moon Sky Coyote would put his paw down right where man's hand is going to go forever. Well, at the time, the moment where he was just about ready to put his paw down there, little Sky Lizard was very fast and very quick and he ran around the backside and put his hand down there. Ooh, he was so proud of himself and he ran off and hit. Oh, that enraged Snilly Moon. Oh, oh! He was so mad at that little lizard, he just wanted to chew him up. Well, everybody kind of looked at that and they saw these little fingers there. And was, oh, wow, hey, that looks pretty good. So it was just because it couldn't be changed anyway. So thank you to little, our little lizard, Onok, for that gift of the hand. Because just think of the things we, we have if we had paws. Oh, so many things that you couldn't do. So we thank little Sky Lizard. And when you see your little lizard running around, you take a look at his little hands and you will see they look very much like yours. And that is all. So I'm gonna take you into another place.
and another person that has a lot to say. So I want to thank you for your time. And in order to go forward, we must go back. So learn your stories. Learn your stories, learn your relatives, and honor them in, in this way of sharing through stories. Woyo, woyo, kiwanan. Thank you, thank you. Goodbye for now. Hola. Haku. Santana. Candelaria. No an chumash. Kafnuna Sespik. Oil. So I said hello in Spanish because that was my first language. I was born in the village of Sespik, meaning Nika. Now some people can't say our language, so they do Sespi. Now the Nika means in part of a story that came to us a long time ago about the first people and how the floods came and how they all turned to stone and hills and mountains. I was born in 1846 or 47, depending on how the Spanish missionaries told me at that time. It was at a time when all my families were there in the, in the missions, working so hard, tealing the lands, tending the cows, making tallow for candles, uh, tanning hides. Oh, they worked so hard all the time. And where I got to learn my language, and later on, I didn't know this, but I would be helping a, a, a doctor, a professor, a teacher, and I talked to him in, in Spanish because I didn't know English. I learned English at some point, and I'm talking to you in this language, but I, I had to speak Spanish and because, you know, we were told as I was growing up not to speak that other language. But I learned it. I learned it very well. And so there were so few of us who were still speaking in those times that, um, you know, we, we were forbidden to do these things. And sometimes even the families, if they saw that we were doing certain things, look at, you know, we, we dress just like the, the Spanish women do in the, in the cloth. And, you know, we had to make sure we, we said our prayers daily to make sure that people didn't look at us and treat us differently. It was not an easy time for us to find our way in the world. And, and what I did in my, in my world is I learned to weave baskets. I love to weave and you know, there's certain people who, who have this ability to be still and I, I'm one of those people. I'm still and I, and I can sit for such a long time. My hands sometimes hurt because of all the baskets I've woven. But you know, there's such a, a, a way of peace for me and, and it was one way of me knowing and keeping my spirit of, of my people uh, in my heart and in my, in my soul to, to weave these beautiful baskets. People started buying my baskets and they never really gave me a whole lot, but I did some beautiful presentation baskets for, for the people that they took back to that big city over in Mexico, they call it, in Spain. So I never really got to keep any, any of my baskets and I needed the money. I used to work as a babysitter for the Pirano family out near Ajay and uh, other places, Matilha, the, the villages down in, uh, in along the river, well, not too far from where I live. But unfortunately, I, I died in a, in, as a result of burns. There was a fire uh, in a stove that exploded and I got burned very severely. And it was it was not good because they just couldn't they couldn't help me. So I think that was in the year of our Lord, 1917 or 16, somewhere around there. But uh, I got to see a lot of things in my time and, and move about in places. I still remember my family and, and our ways. And and we this man who came to us one time and wanted me to speak my language because I didn't understand what he was saying. He was speaking in that foreign American uh, language. My husband had to translate. So he would tell me, he's, he would say, the man would say, tell her how to say hello. So he said, you know, how do you say hello in Spanish? And she would say, oh, 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 haku. So then he would translate in Spanish back to the man. So it took a really long time to do all those translations. And so you can you can look for me. You can look for my baskets and in collections and in museums that they're all over. You can you can go to locally uh, these places here 
in libraries and find my story that has been written down. I was once photographed taking a picture where I'm pointing Hi folks, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties. We were playing the video and then it suddenly stopped. Um, we are hoping to get back to where it stopped so that we can start it again for you. Thank you for that. We are going to have our folks who are behind the camera work on this issue and have it resolved as soon as possible. Also, we did have a question earlier about while the video was playing, uh, asking about the ASL interpretation. Um, the, the reason we are unable to provide that is because these videos are captioned. However, once we get into the discussion portion and into the Q&A later on as well, we will be able to provide the ASL interpretation since that portion of course is not going to be captioned. So in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out these technical difficulties. And by the way, thank you for those uh, comments and chats about the video. We do appreciate that. Um, we would like to see, so let's see what's happening here. Okay. Looks like we're good. Libraries and find my story that has been written down. I was once photographed taking a picture where I'm pointing and, and I don't remember where that was, but you know, we wore the same clothes. They didn't have me dressing in, in the way we used to dress, but I can remember those days. And I remember that, that I love to sing. And, and this time of year, you know, as a woman, we were treated very well during those times. In our times before, my grandmothers would tell me how women were honored. Women were, were leaders. They were medicine people. They had their own special way of dressing during certain times of the year. And, and they were, we were uh, recognized by our, by our biggest grandmother, Nene Ahai, Grandmother Moon. And when she is out, she controls the women's and their cycles. She controls all the, the tides of the ocean. She, her children are the oak trees that, that are here, top and cook here in our, in our lands. And she's, she's so powerful and she is so beautiful when she's in her full brilliance at night. So we remember her, we, we counted our days each time that she was full and then as she moved into her different phases into a no time of no moon so we we always honored her and then when the times changed and women were were you know treated mean and, and treated um not so nice in some cases when they were in the missions um but you know i i was born a little bit after that and so it was really hard to find places to live afterwards we didn't know where to go we didn't know what type of work other than the work that you know my parents did and we, you know with the cattle and the cows and you know we didn't go back we didn't get to go back to my place in Sespeak. We had to find places and towns then after the towns were developed. So, you know, we, but I remember, I remember these things. I remember this time of year. I love this time of year. And to, you call it spring, but I, I, I used to sing a little song and with our instruments here. Nespe, 
That means the trees are in bloom for it is springtime. And oh, I would sing that every time I would see Minigayash, Grandmother Elderberry, and all her beautiful blossoms coming out. And the Ta and Hu, their little flowers are starting already this year. So we think that there's going to be a beautiful, wet, wet, wet year as we, as we move along this year. So we pay attention. I still love eating our traditional foods and the acorn soup. I still love the, the meat of the deer and the rabbit and the little quail. Oh, and then when my relatives come, used to come from the islands, I remember as a girl, they would bring the abalone and the, and the fish out there and the other plants. There was a little plant out there. I think today they call it curly everlasting. That one time, my my tia she fainted, and and the man came with his with his pipe and he he put that plant in his pipe and he smoked it. He blew the smoke on her and you know she revived. And that's the only plant out there. It only grows there on on the on the island of Nemo. So I never got to go there. My work was always so busy because we had a lot of bills and we had to pay a lot of things and. As we, as we, you know, still stay devout to our, to our ancestors in secret because it was not um, safe. It was not safe to pray to our, to our uh, spirits and to our, to our lands anymore. Sometimes. We would say prayers for those that have passed on. We'd make our gifts, and people would even bring these feather poles, and they were really pretty. They're really tall, and feathers come big, long feathers, and we're facing the, the direction of the sun and moon as they go. And we would stay up there for days as people did dances and ceremonies. And there was a whole viejito. He'd come out with his little box, and he would take out this sponge about that big, and it had a rock with a hole. And he placed the rock on the hole and then put it in the ground so it stood up. And just at the right time, after a few days, he would bring and put his hand on the on this rock and he would pull back on it. And you know the sun came up. And I thought, oh, what if we never did that? What would we living our our time darkness? So we are in this world today, and we want you to remember, remember us. Uh, the families, uh, our, our children's children's children, as we move into this world, and we will we will always. The youngest of seven, three brothers and three sisters, and it wasn't always we, we struggled a lot. There was a lot going on in our world, but we I, looking back in growing up out there, I was out there playing with the little bugs, the ladybugs, cell bugs, just collecting polywogs. Uh, I never liked to go swimming. My brother Pat used to always try to drown me, so I got a fear of water. We always fought and wrestled each other. Uh, my older sister, uh, Rachel, she moved out of the house and we lived with my mother, my father, and um, they were separated at that time that I was growing up. But we saw him. He would come take us camping and places. And, you know, I just loved being outdoors. 
And I remember one time I had taken my, my mother on a vacation and we were in Sedona and we took her to the vortexes. She didn't know what the vortex was. And we said, well, it's the place we'd be closest to God. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she really loved that, loved that journey. And she told me at the time that when I was born, she says, uh, you know, when daddy saw you, he goes, oh, look, she looks like all the relatives. So I am kind of the darkest one in my family. And when I was growing up, relatives would come from Ventura and other family friends and would come, oh, we didn't know you had a little sister. Oh yeah, we went to Arizona out there and then there was, she was a little orphan out there and I don't know, maybe one of the Navajo reservations or something. And we fell in love with her. So we adopted her and brought her home. <laughs> like, wow, really? So I grew up knowing always that I was Indian and our last name, Tumamaya, uh, we learned later, we didn't know what that meant. We thought it meant chief, but it was in relationship to our great grandfather, Juan de Jesus Tumamaya, who was born in 1811. And it was at that time when he was a young teenager that his parents died. One um, died, and then a year and a half later, the other died. And this was in San Buenaventura Mission area, the village of Metzconicon, which is the jaw or the tongue of the coyote. So the people recognize Juan de Jesus as later on as an adult. He spoke many different languages. Uh, he spoke English, Spanish, Chumash, and even French. I mean, he was a, he became a capitan, uh, a calde during that time, translating for the native peoples, advocating for them. But when, when he was a young boy, they gave him the name Chumayat, which means an orphan, one who was raised by his grandparents and learned to carry things on his back. So I take that last part of that name for not only from him, his, his grandmother, Sapeyawe, they're uh, born on Limu. You know, she really filled this family with some amazing um, prophecies and, and, and spirit that you know, we, we, are, we are lucky to be listening and pay attention to what's needed in our communities and, and, and to help people remember and inspire uh, them to go back and to learn these things. So, you know, I, I, being a, um, a short, dark Indian woman has not been easy growing up in this generation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dismissing. There's a lot of, oh, you know, we just need some leadership around here, meaning a man. Uh, forgetting that we are in this matrilineal society, matrilocal and matriarchal society where women do lead and women can lead. And it was at a time when I was at a powwow and Mela White Feather, for those of you who are listening, uh, she's an amazing woman. She used to come to my brother-in-law's store where I worked and her and daddy would just sit outside and, you know, just talk and talk. And then one day she saw me at a powwow after my father passed in 1992. And she said, oh, baby girl, that was Mela, except much higher in her, pit, in her pitch. Your daddy, so proud of you. And I said, you know, I know that Mela, I know that he really, you know, knew that I was going, you know, I, I knew that he liked what I did. And he was one of the first people to get me talking into a group. And, but then she said to me, because he knew you were the one. I went, what? Really? She goes, yeah. He saw you, you know, at the store and he points to her and says, she's going to be the one. She's going to be the one to carry on. And I thought, oh, because he actually never really told me that. But he knew, he knew that there was somebody that would, would carry on. We had conversations about people in this, we're talking about the late 70s, early 80s, about how they're talking about this long line of tradition that people were, you know, we got to stand in this unity. Well, it was to get land and, and let something be uh, destroyed and under construction, beautiful lands around the Ventura River in our neighborhood. And they were going to trade off for like, you know, five acres. And I fought against it. They were going to be using our water for a rich golf course. You know, these are stories that, though, I could be all day telling you. But my dad was really proud that I stuck to it and, and just really fought to keep with the people in the community. And he did a he did a, a little tape that I lost. I don't know what happened to it. But he said, here, listen to this. And he said to in this tape, he says, you know, growing up in Ventura with my friends and you know, not knowing a whole lot, he remembers his parents speaking too much. And he had to change his name to Lopez to get work because nobody would hire as an Indian people. But as a young adult, and you know, his twin was a boxer, but he, then he said something about he and his uh, friends, how they would sit on the, out on the street, drinking, getting drunk, 
And and I made a, maybe step back and said, ah, Daddy, do you really want to say that? He goes, well, hell yeah. He said, because that's how it was. Meaning just traditional stuff. So, you know, and that's it, it, so coming back and hearing those words from him, uh, he, when he retired, he had 10 years only in his life to, uh, to really enjoy and embrace that other side of him that he knew was there. And, and when people today, uh, not only relatives, but other people use our family name to uh, profit and to have doors open to them and introduce them to people. And then on the other side with me as a woman, uh, they didn't know my father. These people today, they never met him. They may have heard him do storytelling, but they never ever heard them again or spent time with him or asked him what he needed. Another elder, when my father passed, uh, Tony Romero, I called him to do ceremony. And it was at that time, the 19, August 11th, 1992, that, that uh, during ceremony, Tony came over and he said, I have something for somebody, but they don't know it yet. The responsibility usually goes to the eldest male who spoke. And with that, though, I see somebody here already on that path. And with that, he walked over to me and he handed me his pipe. That's when the tears came. Wow. Okay. So I became an elder at 34. And we talked, Tony and I. And he said, how are you? So I'm really busy. He's going, well, I got really busy too. And I started this. And so the, the advice coming from elders and what you could still learn from elders. And he says to me, learn to say no, because people will come after you. They'll come after you all the time asking you for this and you'll ask, ask you for that. But you know what they never, they'd ask me, oh, Tony, can you do this? Or I need help or I need money. But you know what they never did? And I said, what's that? They never said, Tony, how are you? What can I do for you? What do you need? And that broke my heart. And, and I now know <laughs> what he meant by that. So we are here as elders to help and honor our culture. My culture is first. My family is first, my immediate family. But I have a lot of energy. I've been blessed with, um, with a lot of persistence, <laughs> with a lot of um, energy, with a lot of just uh, seeing things through and not, not wanting to let people interfere what my path has been, which I've always known what my path was from such a young person. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy path because I argue with a lot of people on simple things about protection of our land. That last name, we're carrying things on the back for the social. My grandfather, Cecilio Tumamaya, in his obituary, I will see that no, none of my people work without pay ever again. And so it's carried down, it's carried down through these generations to me. Who in my family will follow? I don't know, I have two daughters and a son. I think maybe my middle daughter, which um, Sapeaway is her middle name. And you may remember that name as I mentioned earlier. And she's, um, she's a strong one, they all are. My son, Aaron, um, he's, he may do something, I don't know, I just, Pray for them. We need to, as women, stand up and we need to uh, move in that place of our power. Uh, there are, um, there's so much that needs to still be put out into this world. So with the energies that I've been given, I've chosen this life this time in our traditional belief system of reincarnation. That's why all life is, is um, sacred. That's why all air, wind, fire, water, it's all sacred. And as we move forward into this place of the crossing over being created from the breath, we move into that place of, of power and of duty and of service. Mm -hmm. There was another song that Candelaria sang. And as we share and move into these places of um, sharing uh, Fernando Vibrato Kitsapawa, you know, this was a time when our ancestors were probably dismissed and really kind of looked at and ostracized, you know, from uttering these, this heathen idolatry and all of that. You know, this is our holy land in which we live and people forget about that. All these people coming with their life ways and their medicines and their um, non-native plants that have just colonized not only the people, but the land here, that they look at our spirituality and they demonize it. 
So we need to we need to do as much as we can. Fernando Labrado, our relative, he said that his uh, mother and and my great grandfather's um, grandmother were sisters or related somehow. I'll take that relationship. So uh, Fernando gets about it. He he brought this song to us about crossing over, about being created from the breath. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean the other creation story of the Rainbow Bridge and people coming over to the mainland? Or does it mean that uh, period of the mission period that we barely survived? I used to think that we could like witness nothing uh, as devastating as what our ancestors did during their time of extinction and genocide with the diseases and all that, but look where we are. Right now with COVID, only it's in everybody of, of dis, you know, disadvantaged communities, the Black Lives Matter, all of that. So history does repeat itself. So we have to be stronger than ever in crossing over into that place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, Julie, for that, uh, uh, sharing the Chumash culture. If you guys have any questions for Julie, you can go ahead and write them in the chat. So our next performer is going to be Sunny Flores. Mr. Flores is an elder, advisor, advocate, director, and speaker whose ancestry can be traced back to the Northern Cheyenne from Lane Deer, Montana. He is a retired aerospace engineer from Northrop Grum Grumman Corps with over 30 years of service. He has since served on, represented, and mentored multiple organizations such as Ventura County Indian Education Consortium, Candelaria American Indian Council, Broken Rope Foundation, and now our very own SCARE program. Mr. Flores played an important role in sharing knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of Native American history and tradition.
Gabby, there's no sound. He fought and my grand and great grandparents fought in the uh, My nation, you want me to start from the beginning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my name is uh, A. Sunny Pinebird Flores. I represent the Northern Cheyenne tribe named here in Montana. But when I was a youngster, I lived all over the reservation. I lived in Crow Agency, I lived in Bernie, I lived in Busby. And, uh, and of course, Lame Deer, Montana, that's where you all come from. That's the biggest little town in the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. So that's where I hail from. And I'm also a uh, descendant of one of the chiefs. Uh, and, and he was a chief of Wooden Lakes. He, he fought and uh, my grand and great grandparents fought in the, uh, in the war with the Battle of the Bighorn, Colonel Custer. That's, they called that the Battle of the Bighorn. So I, I come from that family, the Wooden Leagues family. So, so for me being at Northern Cheyenne, coming from a little uh, reservation in Montana, and at, at that time there was only probably about 9,000 of us. And, and up to date now, I think there's about 12,000 in our reservation. And if my parents wouldn't have brought us to Oxnard, California, uh, no telling what I would have been living in the reservation. And the reservation is not like, you know, the, the local people know. It's hard, you know, I mean, there's, there's no jobs. There's no nothing for the youth to do uh, and, and the older people. So what do you do? You know, it's hard to go to school. Uh, your, your parents are not very well educated. My mother was sent to a a boarding school in, uh, in Ashland, Montana. And uh, when she went, when she when she went to that boarding school uh, off the reservation, they cut her hair and told her not to speak the Northern Cheyenne language. And uh, so that's what happened when she went to that boarding school. But after she was there a few years, her and three other, no, her and two other girls ran away in the, in the winter. And uh, the other two girls froze. My mother made it back to Lane Deer, Montana. So that's, that's through my mother. She's a strong woman. And so she, she brought, she raised five of us. I'm the eldest, my brother, Pete, my sister, Anita, my sister, Linda, and my baby sister Virgie. So, so we were as educated locally, and uh, we all made good. We all made good, you know. And the reason why we made good where we lived, we didn't have much, but we had love in our family. And there was five of us. So, uh, when the TVs started coming out, we didn't have a TV. My mother used to go to the Goodwill and buy boxes of books, and. Uh, we would read the books. And if we wanted to see TV down the road where we lived, there was a uh, black family, Roosevelt Warren. He had a junkyard business. So in that neighborhood, which was out in the rural by Point Magoo, all the surrounding people would go to, to Mr. Warren's house to watch TV. It's a black and white TV. But for us, uh, we would read. So through that, we were all proficient readers. And somehow, that when we went to school, when they tested us, we all had high IQs. So and that was because of our upbringings through where our parents bought us the books and kept us reading. So I thank my mother and father for that, you know. But after that, you know, we grew up in the Colonia. And like everybody say, it's the other side of the tracks or the other side of the town or and it was supposed to be you know, on the lower side, but to us, it was a, the, the bigger side because we were all family. And all the families that lived in Colonia 
We were all like brothers and sisters. We knew each other. We used to go, go to each other's house and eat at each other's uh, house. So it was one big family, but but that's where I grew up at. But we we, uh, we was educated locally. We went to school locally, the high schools locally, the community college locally, and and the outcome came out good because uh, each one of us we made something of ourselves. I became an aerospace engineer. My brother became a federal fire marshal for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, my my oldest sister. She had a, she had a job. She was she was always working. She also went to college. My middle sister, she had the highest IQ, and, uh, and my my little sister. So we were, we all did something, you know. And we represented the Northern Cheyenne tribe here and locally, in in the town called Chicas or the city of Oxnard. So I, I thank my parents for doing that for us because my career. As an aerospace engineer, I, I worked for Northrop Grumman for 30 years. And, uh, and when they chose me to uh, put an application in for a top classified program, as you, we all know it now, it's called uh, the B-2 Stealth Bomber. And that's, we made that for, for the Air Force. And so I worked in that program, in the middle of the program in the secrecy where Still, people didn't know, the outside world didn't know what we were doing, but I, I felt very privileged because I was offered a job, an opportunity, and by me having a straight life, even though I grew up in the hood, I um, persevered and, uh, and I became a uh, aerospace engineer working on different aircrafts. I worked on a lot of the target drones, I worked on the F-18, CD models, ENF Super Hornet models, which is, are now called uh, the Blue Angels. They fly the Blue Angels. And, and my biggest feat was being chosen to work on the B-2 Stealth Bomber. And, and it's just, which is the best bomber in the world. Uh, we made 21 of them. Right now there's one fly, uh, 20 still flying. Uh, one had an accident in Guam. And each aircraft cost two billion, two billion an aircraft. So we're pretty we're pretty well secured, United States people here, with our firepower in the uh, aerospace industry. And beyond that, uh, I think I think this the B two Stealth is going to be good till twenty thirty one. And I think after that, their, their Northrop government is coming with a B-21 bomber, which is supposed to be a lot better. But but I was privileged to work on that program. And uh, even when I go throughout my travels through the town, the state, the country, and I wear my B-2 uh, jacket, T-shirt, polo shirt, baseball cap, I get compliments from many, many people, from many different people, ethnic people, uh, that uh, asked me if I worked in that program. And I tell them yes, so they, they said uh, thank you, but they thanked me. I don't know if you guys uh, seen like on in New Year's, uh, when they have the Rose Parade, beginning of the parade, B2 Stealth, flies right down the middle of Pasadena. And uh, when I see it, sometimes I, I tear up, sometimes I'm really happy, but all I knew it was just a lot of hard, long hours of work. But I'm so happy to be chosen and be Native American. Not too many Native Americans get on those type of programs. So I was really privileged that I accomplished what I accomplished. And, and here I am local, went to school local. My kids are here, my grandkids are here, my great grandkids are here. And uh, to my knowledge, from San Diego to the Northern California, my family is the largest Northern Cheyenne family here in, in Southern California and the state of California. But, uh, so I'm, I'm really happy. And what I did now is after 30 years of <clears throat> working, I volunteered, I, volu I volunteered for the uh, middle school, 
Blackstock. Uh, from there, uh, I worked for all the high schools. There's six high schools in our district, so I worked at Wainimi, I worked at Oxnard, I worked at Camarillo High School, Shan Lylands High School. I did some sp some speaking for the uh, for the other high schools. So I was really privileged to uh, being able to speak to the students in the high school, uh, speaking to the uh, juniors and seniors on their career day. And uh, so I feel good that I could share my life and what I, what I, how I became successful in this field of aerospace engineering. And I also do volunteer work for uh, when I retired, I was, I volunteered for the Candelaria American Indian Council. I stayed there for a little bit. I was, they uh, appointed me interim director for a while. I went to Broken Rope Foundation. I was their vice president. I've been a 25 year uh, volunteer for the Ventura County Indian Education Consortium, which all my kids and grandkids and great grandkids have gone through the program. And I still, I'm still an advisor there. And, and just recently, I'm the uh, community liaison for the Southern California American Indian Resource Center, which is known as SCARE. And uh, it's a new organization here in Ventura County. And so uh, I feel privileged to be a volunteer for them and help them out as much as I can. And the uh, good thing about it, they, they felt I was important, so they, they gave me a, a title. I am their community liaison. So I feel privileged, but you know what? I'm giving it back to the community, back to the children, back to the people. And anything I can do to help the Native American people, I help. So that's that's my story. Okay, this goes out to all the Ox Oxnard College students. I have a granddaughter that's attending there now. Uh, my son attended it. Uh, one of my, uh, oh, I had a boy, two, two great-grandchildren, no, one great-grandchildren and one grandchild and my son attended it. So, you know, and I, when I speak to them, I tell them, hey, you know, if you guys want to continue on, you guys like fine things, you guys like new sunglasses, new, new cell phones, and uh, you like the expensive stuff, the only way you're gonna, you're gonna get it is get an education. And with that education, it's going to take you, the more education you have, the further you're going to get. Uh, when, when, I did, when I was working at Northrop, and I was, cho and I was chosen to uh, work on different programs, uh, now I'm an adult now, and uh, Northrop, they send you to school, they call it tech school, and they teach you all the latest uh, all, all the latest processes, technologies, and and so even though you know you go you go you go through your young life and you go through grade school, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and then once you get a job, and especially in the engineering field, to be you know high tech, you have to take tech classes. So they're always offering it to you. So that the more classes you have, the more you know, the more money you're going to make. But I encourage all students at Oxnard College, you know, if you can get a good education, whatever field that you choose, make sure that, that, that it's something that you're gonna like because you're gonna spend many, many years there. And if you like it, you know, and, and, and you excel, you're gonna make, you know, the money that you wanna make. But the, the college is here, the Oxnard College is here to help you to, to get those uh, skills or the trades and so I encourage all the students or any students to go, go to school. Locally, if you want to go to the community school, uh, colleges, there's three. There's Ventura College, Moore Park College, and Oxnard College. So I encourage everybody to continue to your school at Oxnard College. And uh, I'll be happy. Your family will be happy. And yourself will be happy. So. Good luck. Keep on going to school. Thank you.
All right, thank you, Sunny, for sharing your life experiences with us. We really appreciate it. We are running a little short on time, everybody. So I'm just gonna announce our last two performers. The last two performances. The first one is gonna be a, a short story by Eleanor Fishburn. Our Eleanor Fishburn is gonna be reading. She is a documented Trimac descendant from the Aril. Sorry. Very honest. Thank you. <laughs> and from my family line, tied to the Channel Islands and the mainland, including influential provincial uh, capitals, including Hamalilo. Oh, this is the oh, Mount, so Malibu, Carpinteria, and those pueblos, as well as other historic Centrino Barbarino communities. She is a parent of three children and grandparents as well. And grandparents, well, she spends time supporting them in many of their activities. Eleanor is an active and outgoing woman who finds great pleasure in bringing unity to our community. So she's going to be reading a tale called The Sugar Bear Story. Haku, haku, kashta katiwa, gawasha chishmaya. Samthan and Eleanor. Greetings, my friend, and good afternoon. My name is Eleanor, and today I have the privilege and permission to read to you a Barbarino Chumash tale, The Sugar Bear Story. The story has been told and written by Mary J. Yee and is actually illustrated and retold by her daughter, Ernestine Ignacio de Soto. When I was little, lying in the dark, I listened to the nightly bedtime stories told by my mother. Now that I am past my mother's age, I feel that those stories were for her as much as they were for me. They kept the memories of her Chumash childhood alive as they filled mine. The story of the sugar bear was not one that she told me, but I found it in her journals where she recorded her language in stories while she worked with anthropologist and linguist J.P. Harrington in the 1950s. This story has become near and dear to my heart because my mother loved bears and so do I. My Chumash stories carry the message of how you should behave in life. The moral of the sugar bear story is how you should treat your guests. And to acknowledge, here are Ernestine's two daughters and myself, many moons ago, living descendants of Mary J. E. The Chumash history. The homeland occupied by Chumash peoples was first settled some 13,000 years ago. According to archeological evidence, over time, the population increased and the people continued to adapt their way of life to the local environment. At the time of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo's voyage in 1542, about 20,000 people lived throughout the territory where Chumash language were spoken. Between 1772 and 1804, five missions were founded to convert the Chumash populations. The language spoken in different parts of the Chumash region Hi folks, so it looks like we have, oh, let me uh, allow my interpreter to join. I'm sorry about that, Rocio. So it looks like we have encountered another technical difficulty here. We do apologize, of course. This is our first multicultural event done fully online, fully virtually. However, we do want to thank all of you for joining us today. We do know that we went over time just a bit, however, we are asking you 
if you are able to, to please fill out the survey that we have included in the chat. Also, we are going to ask our friends at SCARE if they can please include a link to their resources, to their website. Um, we, they are also going to provide the remaining videos that we were not able to watch today. They are going to stream them. Um, we are hoping that those will be posted to their websites as well. So if we are able to, um, if we can have our folks over at SCARE, please uh, share their information uh, on the chat. As for everyone who attended today, we thank you so much for joining us. We do apologize for these technical difficulties. However, we do hope that our next event will be in person and we will have all of these amazing presenters uh, in person for you so you can join us then. Thanks again. And we hope to see you at our next event.